Hello and welcome to Corel Draw for Laser Engraving. This is session number four. I'm Jimmy Dubose and we're going to cover several topics today. First topic we're going to cover is fit text to path. So to get started I'm going to select this text, hold down my shift key and click on the circle. Then I'm going to go up to text menu. Under text menu I'm going to select, select fit text to path. Now it's too close to the path, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the distance from the path up here in my property bar. And I'm not happy with how much of that path it's covering, so I'm going to stretch the spacing out. I'm going to use my shape tool for that. Select the text. You have this icon over here that controls spacing. If I hold my shift key down, I drag that to the right. It increases the spacing between the words. If I, if I release my shift key and I drag this to the right, it increases the space between all characters. Now we're going to do the bottom half. So let's hold up, select the text, hold down my shift key and click on the circle. Let's go back up to the text menu. And we're going to select fit text to path. If I rotate that text around the bottom of the circle, I'll find that the text is upside down. So to prevent that problem, what I can do is go up here and I'm going to mirror this horizontally, and I'm going to mirror it vertically. Let's increase the distance from path until it lines up with our original text. Next, we're going to go to this offset value up here in the property bar, and we're going to decrease that number and, until it moves around to the bottom of the circle. I'm going to stop right there and I want to change my spacing. So we're going to go back to our shape tool. I'm going to select my text, again using this icon on the right. If I hold my shift key down, I can drag this to the right to increase the space between the words, release my shift key, and then I can increase the inner character spacing. Again, clicking and dragging with my left mouse button. Let's go back to the pick tool which will allow us to start decreasing our offset again until we get it centered on the bottom of the circle. To finish out this, this logo, I want to use this keystone. So I'm going to select this keystone, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a circle copy of it all the way around my image here. To do that, over here on the right-hand side, I already have Transform selected in my Dockers. And in the, in the transform docker itself, I want rotate selected. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my angle, which happens to be 5 degrees. Then my center position, which is the center of the circle, which is 2.5 by 2.5. And, and then you'll notice I have number of copies here at 71. If I take 360 degrees and I divide it by 5, I get the number 72. However, I've already created one of the keystones. So I can just decrease that number by 1, so we're going to do 71 copies. Finally, let's click on Apply. and that image is finished. We don't have to just do circles, we can actually make text fit to any kind of path, so in this case we're going to fit it around a spline curve. So I'm going to click on my text, hold down my shift key, click on the spline curve, go up to the text menu, and select fit text to path. Let's use the distance from path, let's increase that a little bit to move it away from the curve. Let's go to my shape tool, and let's change the spacing. So let's hold down the shift key and we're going to drag this to the right to increase space between words, release the shift key, and then continue to drag this icon to the right until we get the spacing we want between the characters. If I go back to my pick tool, I can actually change my offset and move that along the path. So I'm going to do vertical text next. So let's go ahead and click on fire extinguisher text. Let's hold down our shift key and click on a vertical line that I drew. Go up to text menu, come down to fit text to path. Now I could have done that same thing by just rotating this to 270 degrees, but I'm not finished yet. Let's go and change the text orientation. So up in the property bar, you can see I have text orientation. Click on the roll up menu and go down to your last option here, which is this orientation here, and that's what I'm looking for. 
Of course, I'm not happy with the actual spacing between those characters. So let's go back to our shape tool again. We'll click on the text, hold down our shift key, drag this icon to the right to get some space between the words, release the shift key, and then just move this down the line. Now, one thing that you need to be aware of is if you keep moving the spacing or keep increasing this, there's an end point on this line. In this end point, the text will not go past that. So as I start to drag this to the right, text will start to stack on itself. So let's go ahead and drag that back to the left, back to where it was, some more, and we're almost finished here. So I want to break this apart now from that line. So let's go ahead and click on the object. Let's go up to the object menu, and let's break text apart. You can do this with any of these examples that I've done. If you need to get rid of the, the line or the path that you use to set the, uh, the, the path along, the text along. So let's go ahead and grab our text and move it over to the left. And I can stretch this out like you do see in a lot of fire extinguisher signs. In this example, we're going to use the knife tool to create this, uh, this graphic. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to cut out of some map board. This would be the center of photograph, and this would be the outside map board. But what I want to do is I want the top of the text to be cut out in part of that. In the bottom of the text, I want to engrave so I can still be able to read the name. First step is to select the name, and let's come over and let's right-click in our color palette and left-click on the slash so that we have no fill. I want to change my duplication distance up here with nothing selected to a minus 8 inches. I want to change my nudge amount to 8 inches. So let's click on the name. Let's go up to the edit menu. Come down to duplicate. So once I have my name duplicated over here on the left, let's go ahead and weld the original name to the frame. So coming up here in our property bar, we have weld selected. As you can see, that got rid of the bottom half of the characters. Let's change that to red so we can see the difference. I'm right-clicking on red in the color palette. Now I have this um, guideline here that represents basically the cutting point across the characters. I'm going to go to my knife tool. So up here in my knife tool, normally this is the crop tool up here in our toolkit. So click on the right-hand arrow and then come over and left-click on the knife tool. Then we take our tool I'm going to align it with that uh, guideline, drag across, and release. You can see now that that is, we can delete that off, and all we have left is just the bottom half of the characters. So let's go ahead and select the bottom half, and we'll hit our nudge key, which is set to 8 inches, and it's going to put it right back in position. We can change the line thickness so that it's going to engrave and look good and let's zoom in to see our, our finished effect. So again, it's the red part's going to cut out, and then the black part is going to engrave. And we'll have a finished result of being able to read the full name. The next tool I want to discuss is the Virtual Segment tool. What I have here to start out with is I have a heart shape, and I drew this red line to cut down in the center of the heart for two pieces, but let's say I want to delete this left side. If you go over here to where your crop tools were located, click on the down arrow, and we want to select Virtual Segment Delete. I bring my tool over, and you'll see the tool will actually pitch up 90 degrees, and that shows that you've actually touched a line. Click on that, and it's gone. Okay, now let's do the same thing over here. So I have a banner over the top of a circle, and I'm going to come over and I'm going to get rid of the intersecting lines. Okay, and in this final example, I have a spiral that I created. And then I took a line and just went across the spiral. But I'm just using that as, as a reference for the, the section virtual segment delete tool. So let's go ahead and let's get rid of some of these lines.
And when I'm finished with that, I could just get rid of this horizontal line that I put on there. So you see the line doesn't actually have to be grouped together or combined with it. We can just use it as just a point of reference for cutting. The next tool I want to talk about is the Smart Fill tool. In the Smart Fill tool, we can actually fill intersecting regions. So let's go ahead and let's say I want to fill in this area right here between these two triangles. and It will become its own shape. So if I come over and I left click, that's now its own shape. So I can grab that and I can move that away from my original objects, engrave it or edit it or whatever I want to do. So these are closed polygons, but over here these are open. So these lines themselves are actually, I'm going to fill in the middle of those. So let's come over and let's left click. And now that is its own shape. Okay, let's look at this fleur de lis. So let's say I want to fill this black area and all these are independent lines. So let's go ahead and let's do that and create its own shape. So let's left click in there. And as you can see, that's its own shape now. In this last example, what I've done is I have some text and I have a curve that runs through that text. What I'm looking for is to give a visual effect of a wave or ocean going through this text. So I'm going to click on my Smart Fill tool and let's just click through our example here and fill the bottom half of all that text going up against that curve. Once I'm finished with that, I can just come back and select that curve and delete it. And there we have our finished effect. Next uh, topic we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about uh, print merge. So to create a print merge, first thing I have to do is create a template. In this case, I've created a name badge. And you can see I have my text at the top and I have, you know, basically the group name at the bottom with a flourish in the middle. So if you're going to do a print merge where we're going to put variable text into this line that I have selected, you want to make sure that you have those separate from other lines of text. In other words, break apart your text so that they're individual lines. Before we take that step, let's look at the text inside Microsoft Excel. This is the variable text that I'm going to use, and I want you to notice that the very first row has my column header in it. So this has all the member names. And then down below, you have all of your variable text. If you did not have that first row set to uh, the header, it's going to take the first name and use that as the header when you go to import it. So we're going to save this out. We highly recommend that when you go to save a file out that's variable text that you use a tab delimited text file. CorelDRAW can import an Excel spreadsheet, but we found that there are various issues that crop up whenever you do that, and that the text tab delimited file is the most foolproof, bulletproof way of doing a uh, print merge. So we go ahead and we save it out as that. Now, when you do that, you've got to make sure that you come over here and you close out of Excel. The reason being is that if you have that file saved out as a tab delimited text file, and it's still open in Excel, it won't allow you to complete the print merge in CorelDRAW. So I have my line selected. Let's go to File menu. Come down to Print Merge. Select Create or Load Print Merge. I'm going to import the file that I'm looking for. Now my files aren't displayed even though I'm in the correct folder. If you look down here at the bottom, it's defaults to a rich text format. We need to change that to the format we're looking for, which happens to be text files. I select my text file. I click on Open. There's all my variable text. Let's click on Finish. And I have this floating dialog box here that has all the information that I need. I want to assign this variable text to my uh, template name. So let's go ahead and to do that, I need to swipe through my text. So let's swipe through it select my field and insert that field. So when you left click on insert field, you'll notice that you get these carrots on either side of the, uh, of the column header. Um, those are just to signify that it is ready to do a print merge. Okay, 
So you have two options under print merge. You can merge to new document or you can just perform print merge. We recommend doing merge to new document for a couple reasons. Number one, I might want to save this template for use in the future. If you use the same column headers all the time, you could actually just use the same template over and over um, for the same company. And also sometimes with perform print merge, we have seen where the very first um, name is skipped. So we feel that merge to new document is your best option. So let's select that. Okay, and I'm going to close out of that window. And as I hit page down on my keyboard, you'll see all the different names. If all these were pre-cut at this point, we could just go ahead and send it to the laser. But I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you how to do a plate in position to put all these on one large sheet of material. Our next example is going to be a plaque. So in this case, we're going to have two variables. We're going to have the name and we're going to have the years of service. Looking at the file in Excel, you can see that I have column A has a header on the first row, says names, and column B has years. And of course, the first, the first um, plaque is going to have Bill Johnson two years, and then it's going to have Bob Williams five years, so on and so forth. We, of course, again, would save this out as a tab delimited text file. And just remember after you do that, that you want to close out of Excel. Back in Corel, let's go to the file menu and come down to print merge, create or load print merge. Go to import file, change your, your text that you're looking for to a TXT or your file you're looking for is a TXT. And we're going to select plaque names, click on open. And there are our headers, names and years, and all of our plaques. Let's click on finish. And we have our little floating uh, tool dialog here. Let's go ahead and assign names to the variable on the template. So let's swipe through the text and let's insert that field. Let's do the same thing for years. And we'll select our variable for the field for years and click on insert selected field. And at this point, we're ready to merge to new document. As I hit page down, you will see all the different names and years. Okay, so we're gonna go to our next example, which are tags. And in this example, we're going to use uh, serialization. I show the cutout here. This is a one and three quarter inch diameter. So let's assume for a second that we had some metal plates that we want that are already pre-cut and we're just dropping them into a template or a fixture. And we're, we want to be able to, to pop those out easily. So what I've done is I've created a little tab where we could use a tool to pop those out of the fixture. So if I hold down my shift key and I click on the circle, I can go up here and I can weld those together. All right, so this is my variable text. It's aligned by itself. Let's go to File Menu, come down to Print Merge, Create or Load, Print Merge. We're going to add a column. We're going to give it a name. Let's call it Serial. We're going to say that it's numeric. And we got to pick our format. So let's say our format is going to be four zeros before the number. So it's basically padding it with zeros so that we have never more than five full characters. We're going to have a starting value of one. We're going to turn off continual increment and we're going to change our ending value to 100. Click on add. You can see all the numbers that it's created. Let's click on finish. Again, we have our floating dialog here. We're going to get into text mode and we're going to swipe through all that text and we're going to insert the selected field. Don't worry that the carrots and everything are wider than the tag because remember, we have our numbers are fewer characters than what we see here. So it's not going to engrave beyond the size of the tag. Finally, let's go to merge to new document.
We're going to talk about plate imposition next. So to talk about plate imposition, let's go to our first example, which were the name badges. And what I want to do once I've created this is let's go to File menu and come down to Print Preview. In Print Preview, you can see that you have this one uh, plate on a little bit larger size piece of, uh, piece of material. Um, let's go to our Preferences and let's see what we have selected there. So we don't have our engraver selected. Let's go ahead and select our engraver. Let's go to Preferences for the engraver and change our plate size to the size of the material. So let's say 24 inches by 12 inches. So now we see our small 1x3 badge on a much bigger plate. So over here on the left hand side, we're going to select Imposition Layout. In this roll up menu right here, we're going to go down and select Margins. We want Auto Margins turned off. This will move the character or the plate, I should say, in the upper left hand corner. Because these are tags that I'm going to cut out, I usually like to give myself a little bit of a margin from the edge in case the material is not square. So I'm going to move this over a quarter of an inch and I'm going to move it down a quarter of an inch. Let's go back to basic settings. Before I go to duplicate my columns across, I want to maintain my document page size. As we go across the plate, what if I could fit one more? Can I fit one more? Let's try. You can see that you can't because it's hanging over the right hand side. So let's decrease that and let's go ahead and create our rows. Same thing happens here. What if I go one more? You can see that no you can't because it's going to overhang your edge of your material. So let's decrease that back so we have 11 rows. If I click on my preview, you'll be able to actually see the list of all your names. If I'm going to use this same layout over, I can go to save that imposition layout so I can use it in the future. And you can give it a name right here. Let's go to our second print merge. So in this case, I have 12 different plaques, and let's say the plaques are already pre-cut, and I'm just going to stack them on my table side by side. We still need to use imposition layout. So let's come over to Print Preview. And as you can see, my plate size is not the size of my table. Let's go up to our preferences, the little gear up here, and we're going to select the laser system. And we're going to change our size of our sheet material. So let's do this to the size of the table. So 24 inches by 18 inches. Now let's go to our imposition layout. Let's go to our roll up menu here and let's change to edit margins. Let's turn off auto margin. Let's go back to basic settings and let's Duplicate. Oh, let's go ahead and let's maintain document page size. Since we're not cutting it out, we can actually stack all those across. Let's see how many we can we go down one. Let's see. Yes, so we can get eight of them per sheet. Let's go back up here. And I don't want to, I need to do current document. Sometimes you'll have a problem here where this says current page but I want to do current document. So I'll click on OK. And let's go back to my preview here. And you can see I have two signatures. So that means that on the first sheet, I can get the first eight plaques. And on the second sheet, I can get the remaining four. When you send this to your laser, it's basically going to run the first sheet. And then it'll have page two for you to run the second sheet. Okay, so we have our serialized 100 tags. So let's do that. So let's go up here to Page. Let's come down to Print Preview again. Let's go to our Preferences. 
and we're going to select the helix. And let's say my fixture is 24 inches by 12 inches, standard material size. We'll go to Imposition Layout. You know the drill. Let's come down to Edit Margins. Turn off Auto Margins. That puts it in the upper left-hand corner. Let's go back to Edit Basic Settings. And we'll start to build our sheet. But before we do that, let's maintain document page size. And let's start to go across. Mm, that's really close. It looks like we can get 12 across, though. Let's go ahead and go down. So we can get 72 on this sheet. Let's go ahead and do my preview. So I can get 72 of those tags on this one sheet. Now you see that I have my red part, right? When you go to print, inside your um, print dialog, your actual dashboard driver, you can set, if you're just doing the engraving portion, you can just select raster. If you're gonna do the cut the fixture, you can do just the vector. So there's no reason to delete that um, the circle out of your layout. You can just come back and just select raster when you're ready to engrave those aluminum tags. And of course, down here at the bottom, we have a second signature sheet to complete the 100 tags. That's in position layout. Now, if we were cutting out those tags for the name badges and we put a box on each one of those plates, we're going to have to sit there and wait for it to cut each individual box. Well, we have a macro that was written by Roy Brewer that comes through here and handles that problem for us. So what we have to do to start out with is we have to have a box. You'll notice that this is one by three. You'll also notice up here that I actually have set it with the upper left hand origin to a quarter inch from the left and a quarter inch from the top. Once you have your macros installed, you come over here and you select scripts. And I have my tag cut macro right here. So I'm going to open up my tag cut macro. And I'm going to run tag cut right here. So you can actually double click on it here or you can come down and you can just click on the run button. Either way, you get this dialog box that pops up. It has already grabbed the size of the plate for me right here. And instead of using columns and rows, I want it to fill up the sheet. So what I'm going to do is give it the available size. I want to have at least a quarter inch all the way around my, my material so as a scrap. So I'm going to set my size here to, on the width, 23.5. And on the height, I want to set 11.5. Okay, it's going to be set for optimization. It's going to delete my initial rectangle. And whenever I go ahead and click on create, it has created all the plates. Let's exit this and let's take a look at it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ungroup that. And let's zoom in. I want to show you how this optimization works. So these are all individual lines. There are no boxes here. It's all vertical and horizontal lines. So if I'm looking at the actual path it's going to take, you can see that this line's going up and this line's going down, and it alternates going across the sheet. Same thing goes for the horizontals. So this one's going from right to left, and this one is going from left to right. So it's going to go through all your layout serpentine so that it's the most efficient, fastest cut. This works really, really well for any kind of a, a tag that you're trying to cut out. And you may be thinking, well, what happens if I want round cornered cutouts or I want scalloped corners? Well, we can handle that too. Okay, so let's go back and let's zoom back out to the page. And let's run tag cut again. This time I'm gonna put a corner radius. And let's say I'm gonna do a corner radius of, let's say an eighth of an inch. Same thing here, I'm going to type in 23.5, and I'm going to put in on my height, I'm going to put 11.75. Let's click on Create.
One thing that's very that's great about this program in the way that Roy wrote it is that I can now let's go ahead and get my pick tool and let's select this. I'm going to ungroup it. These centerpieces are all actually independent of all of the vertical lines. So if I want to, if I look at these, they're all going to cut individual. So you still don't have a box that's being drawn. What you have is you have these, these pieces are individual from the horizontal and the vertical lines. So it's still going to cut extremely efficiently, but you're not going to have any double cuts. None at all. Let's go back, let's go back a few steps. Okay, use an undo. Okay, so let's go and run this program again. You have to select the box and we're going to go to tag cut and we're going to hit play. And this time I want to actually have round corners like dog tags. So if I come over here and I type in 0.5, which is half of the width of the plate, you'll notice he has some instructions up here telling it needs to be a thousandth of an inch under. I'm going to purposely make it make it give me the error message. So we're going to come in and type 23.5, and we're going to type in 11.5. Tells me the radius is too large. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in 0.499, and let's try again. And there we have it. So one final thing, let's do the scalloped corners. So let's run this tag cut again. Let's type in 0.15. Let's say scalloped corners and 23.5 and 11.5. So these are going to come out as scalped corners and each of these cutouts are going to be independent of the horizontal and vertical lines. So again, no double cutting. If you want a copy of those macros and some other macros, you need to go to our website. Uh, certainly you can take your uh, smartphone, you can scan this uh, link right here and it will take you right to that page. The final thing we're going to cover for this session is we're going to talk about how to size a font precisely. So one thing you'll notice here is that this text, my, my gap between these two lines is 1.25 inches. So typically 100 points equals one inch. One thing though that you're not, that you're not aware of is that CorelDRAW takes into account the descenders and the ascenders inside a font when it does sizing. And pretty much all printing programs do this. They don't look at the actual main character as taking up a certain cell size and using that as a, as a specific or accurate size. So what you need to do to, to make sure this comes out right is you can just move the decimal point over two places and that's how you can get 125 point to equal this particular size. So again, you have your senders and we have descenders and I'm trying to figure out how to get that A exactly 1.25 inches. Again, if I want quarter inch letters, move the decimal over two points and you have 25 point. If I want half inch letters, same thing, move it over two places and you have 50 point, or one inch equals 100 points. Thank you for attending this session number four. We look forward to seeing you for session number five.